Hey everybody, it's Robert and I'm coming to you with another adventure in history and today we are in the middle of absolutely nowhere. As we look around through the woods, you'll see absolutely nothing. No signs of modern civilization. No highway noises. And on this rainy day here in Georgia, not even birds singing. But what I'm here to show you is even though I'm in the absolute middle of nowhere today, nearly 200 years ago, there were quite a few people here. Right now I'm standing in the middle of the Mount Zion graveyard, forgotten in the woods of Georgia. Let's take a look. So we're standing in the old Mount Zion Baptist Church graveyard. The land for this church was deeded from John Watkins to the Mount Zion Baptist Church in 1835. Not long after the land was deeded for a church here, it is believed that the church may have moved from this location in 1837 to nearby Baldwinville as there was another church by the same name, Mount Zion, created there in 1837. So from at least 1835 to 1837, there was a church here. There are many very early settlement style graves located here in this graveyard. Of course, being established in 1835 here, it wasn't long after European settlement first began on this side of the Flint River here in Georgia back in 1826. All right, so we're gonna go through the cemetery and try to identify as many graves as we can. We'll start down here at the end. This is the furthermost out grave that I see. It's only an indention in the ground and a field stone at the head and the foot. And then behind that are two more indentions in the ground, right in front of that fallen over tree. And then if we come over here, we'll find our first marked grave, one of only three out here in this cemetery. You can see this is kind of in the style of a Confederate marker with a pointed top, but it is not a government issued Confederate headstone. This is the headstone for William Isom. He was born June 6th, 1830, and he died October 26th, 1887. At the bottom, rather than an epitaph, it reads a Confederate soldier. William Isom was born in South Carolina and at some point came to Georgia. On the 1850 census, he was a farmer holding real estate valued at $3,500 and a personal estate valued at $1,500. He married his wife here in Talbot County in 1848. It is believed that he enlisted as a private in 1862 in Company B, the Border Rangers or the Muscogee Mounted Guards from Muscogee County, Georgia of the 20th Regiment Georgia Infantry, Army of Northern Virginia in the Confederate States Army. He surrendered at Appomattox, Virginia on April 9th, 1865. According to Find a Grave, he had three children um, and his wife, and none of them are buried here. Um, he, his wife apparently moved on somewhere else after his death and lived to 1906, and his children are also buried elsewhere, but here he is. All right, going past Mr. William Isom's grave, the first really interesting grave is this remains of some kind of tomb right here. We do have a large field stone that looks like it was planted in the ground, probably marking a grave right here. And throughout here, I see other field stones. There's one, at least one right there. Kind of hard to see with all of the pine straw 
and the downed trees covering everything up. But I'm really fascinated by this grave marker right here. I'm not sure if this was just a rock wall around a single grave or if this may not have been what is called a grave house that would have had a roof over it at one time. You can see three corners still standing. Just as they were built many years ago. And judging from the lack of rock inside of this, I don't believe that this was what we would know as a false crypt where it had a rock roof over it. It was either um, just a rock wall around a burial or maybe something else like a grave house that I mentioned. A very interesting early settlement style burial right here. Right below that is another indention, so another grave right there. And if we turn around, I don't see many more right here. There is, I just stepped on this as a loose rock, probably off of that wall and fell over. So we'll go over here to our next marked grave. And this one is pretty interesting. This is M.T. Watkins, born July 25th, 1882, and he died November 15th, 1898. We hope to meet thee. Just a child buried here. Now I find it interesting that there are later graves out here. All of the other graves, aside from these three marked ones, appear to be very early settlement graves. Whereas these are obviously a newer grave, and it leads me to wonder if the church did move in 1837 from this location, um, if they just continued to use this as a burial ground, or if it was family's choice to come to the old church graveyard and continue burying here. Also interesting to note that while this cemetery is listed on Find a Grave, um, the recording for this cemetery uh, takes a transcript from the 1970s, and the 1970s transcript only recorded two marked graves here, and there's actually three. Uh, there is no Find a Grave listing for M.T. Watkins buried here either. But, so somehow he was overlooked when, and back in the 70s, when this was first evidently rediscovered. So coming behind the child Watkins there, we've got great examples of these early settlement graves, these box tombs made out of stacked field stone. And I almost did not see this one right here. This would have been a child. You can see it's a very small box tomb with this old cedar tree laid across it. And there do appear to be more indentions out this way. I see one evidently right there. Then over there, just under the base of that tree, there's another. Then going back the opposite way, we have another box tomb of children here. And then a third marked with field stones right here. There's one there and one there. So three unknown children buried here. And there was certainly no shortage of rock for marking these graves in this area. If we look down this hillside, we see many, many rocks. And we are in the hills of Talbot County, very close to the Flint River. Over here, here's another box tomb, unmarked. 
and probably the grave of a teenager or young adult. It's a very small grave, but not quite the size of a child's grave, just a little bit bigger. And I get asked many times, these are false tombs. The burial is underground, generally speaking, but these served as a grave marker for early settlers here. And I've heard before these confused with Native American burials, but this is a European settler style of burying. Two unknown adults here. And then further over, another row of children. We've got one there, one there, and one there. I pointed this out just a minute ago, but we'll walk over here and acknowledge these unmarked graves. I actually did miss one over here on this side of the tree right there. There's one, and these are marked with field stones. See the field stone right there? Here's another one right here, marked with a field stone. And you can see another one right there under the base of this old pine tree here, marking a grave. Now this grave is further back from the cemetery. I'll give you a perspective on it in just a moment. I do see another one right here. This is just an indention. And this grave appears to be the last burial here, which may explain its distance from the rest of the cemetery. It's certainly the newest marked burial. If we look back, I only visually see these two graves. I've got this one, then the indention behind it. I don't see anything apparent in the space between this burial and that last row of rock tombs right there. Now, of course, a good rule of thumb is that for every unmarked grave you see, every indention you see, you multiply it by three to get an accurate idea of how many actual burials are there because so many times these indentions will get filled in, covered over, and won't be visible anymore. Now that being said, right after I said that I did spot two more indentions and the funny thing is when you see these you see an indention in the ground and you wonder is that actually a grave? And then it's confirmed by a planted field stone right here. And this is one thing that really gets me excited when you start looking at a cemetery like this and start finding these unmarked graves. And I know that the indentions don't show up well on camera, but looking out here, it's like once you see one, then you're able to tell where others are. So I do see this one right here, followed by this one with the field stone then one right there, and then I just saw another one right here. You can see a clear indention right at the base of that tree. And I wonder if there, yep, there's a field stone marking it. You can see the dirt has just built up around it over the years, so it's just barely sticking out of the ground. I bet each of these indentions has a field stone marking it. Just rake away the leaves a little bit. Not one here, but definitely another clear indention right there. So going back, we'll take a look at the final marked grave in this cemetery. This is W.D. Watkins. 
He was born October 11th, 1851, and he died January 12th, 1900. At the bottom it says, at rest. Now, Find a Grave has very little information about W.D. Watkins listed, other than the fact that he was an ancestor of a Mr. Irby Cook. Now, Irby Cook, back in the 1970s, is the one who evidently rediscovered and documented this cemetery and made sure it was documented. Um, Irby Cook was born somewhere near Big Laser Creek, and that is exactly where we are right now, is near Big Laser Creek. Um, so he evidently grew up somewhere around here. No doubt W.D. Watkins lived very close by to here as well. So that leads me to the next thing that I would like to discuss about this cemetery. In the 1970s description of this cemetery, it appears that this cemetery was almost inaccessible and the only roads that led to it were old as described as Jeep roads or possibly old wagon roads that had long been since disused. And we can actually see one or the remains of the road to this cemetery right here. This is an old roadbed that cuts up right beside the cemetery. Now there is a more modern road that leads into the cemetery. We are on a wildlife management area right now, so this is state land. And so they have put in some slightly improved roads, but I still recommend a four wheel drive for getting down them because they are only slightly improved, especially with the wet season that we've had in Georgia right now. But I find it very fascinating to be able to see the old roadbed here, and you can see how deep this road had been cut by the height of the embankments right there. So evidently, this is probably an early settlement road that would have led to this church. Now, the other thing that I would love to know is where the church actually stood. I see no visible foundation remains or anything like that around here that are a telltale sign of the church, of course. If it did move in 1837, as is theorized, then that's a very long time for this place to have been forgotten. Also, you can see how close the cemetery was to the modern, or to the old road, is the embankment, and there are the burials right up there. So we often come to these places and we can't help but wonder um, what happened to all of the people living here, why they moved away. We're nearly 180 years after this church was established here and it is no more. There's no signs of it other than the cemetery. There's very little sign of the European settlement that was here after that time. And we know that by the 1970s, this place was basically forgotten. A little bit less so today because it's documented in various places and the roads are just a little bit easier to get to it. But that doesn't answer the question of where the people went that lived here and why they left. Why they left. Um, again, if the church did move in 1837 after being established in 1835, why did it move to another location? And I actually do have a few theories on that, but I'll tell you about those on the next video. So I hope you have enjoyed this adventure. Um, amazing, always amazing to come to a place where you don't expect to see anything. It seems as though it's been trees here forever. But of course, we know that that's not the case because most of the trees out here are all young growth trees. But we come to a place that seems like it's just wilderness and always has been and find signs of life from a very long time ago. I hope you've enjoyed. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And stay tuned. For the next video, we hear my theory as to why people may have left this area. We'll see you next time.